Well, thank you uh, for inviting me to speak at your journal club. Uh, of course, Dublin is definitely not part of the London area. And I guess historically, this has been quite a shaky point. Uh, so let's not tell my ancestors about this. Um, <laughs> All right, so I'll be talking about separation of variables for higher rank spin chains. So why do I want to talk about, first of all, higher rank spin chains? So you might think, well, what, what new things can we actually learn about spin chains? We've had algebraic beta ansatz for quite a while. All these techniques, they all work very, very well. What, what new things can we actually learn? And the motivation for this is from the so already we have mm. examples. Mm. Sorry, sorry. Could we uh, mute some microphone? Okay, I can continue. So already uh, from ABS CFT, we know one very nice thing, which is quantum spectral curve. And what quantum spectral curve tells us is really how to solve the spectral problem for n equals four super young mills. And the key objects that we use in quantum spectral curve are these Q functions, which are very, very similar to the Q functions which we have in uh, Heisenberg XXX uh, spin chain. And so this is very, very nice. We can really say lots of nice things about the spectrum uh, of operators, but what about other observables? What about correlation functions? And if we believe in this idea that Q functions should really know everything about the state, then Q functions should also know uh, about correlation functions, weight functions, and so on. And already we have some simple examples where really uh, correlation functions, when expressed in terms of Q functions, simplify massively. Uh, but to really understand this kind of more at a fundamental algebraic level, it's really kind of important to understand separation of variables uh, for higher rank spin chains. And maybe you think, oh, well, separation of variables has also been around for a while. Spinon did everything with separation of variables. So all you have to do is look up the answer in some in some paper, and then you try to do this, and you fall off your chair, and you realize that no one really knows how to do uh, separation of variables properly beyond SU2, at least until a couple of years ago. So what I'm going to describe is some recent uh, development which have taken place um, in this program. So the thing I'm mostly going to talk about is uh, SU and XXX uh, spin chain. All right, so the fundamental object which we have in this spin chain is this R matrix. Which is an operator on two tensor sides. So I denote this index R A subscript K, which depends on two parameters, U and theta, which are some complex numbers. And what this does is it acts as U minus theta times identity on space A with identity on space K minus I and then permutation operator on the sites A and K. Okay, so this is all nice, but it's kind of slightly easier to represent all this graphically, it's especially for this kind of whiteboard talk. So it's common to denote this as two intersecting lines, where here we have space A and space K and the parameter u, and the parameter theta. Okay, so from here we can build up the monotomy matrix by taking a bunch of products of these R matrices. So this is going to be n by n matrix Okay, which looks a bit like this. So this will be theta L, theta two, theta one. So these are spin chain in homogeneities. And this G here is some twist matrix, which I need to, uh, mostly to remove some degeneracies, which will appear later on in the problem. Okay, so this is some diagonal, uh, matrix. Uh, it doesn't have to be diagonal. Mostly we just care about the fact that it has distinct eigenvalues. Okay. So here we have our monotomy matrix. It's entries G, I, J or some operators on our Hilbert space. So for the moment, I'm looking at spin chains in fundamental representation. So each uh, each spin chain site carries the defining representation uh, of SUN. 
So later, when things become a bit cooler, I'll talk about bigger representations and the nice things that happen when we look at those. So, right, so how do I work out this space issue? So once we have these operators, we can define uh, our commuting operators, our commuting uh, conserved charges. So these are transfer matrices. Okay, so what are these? So the first one is quite nice. Just given by taking the trace over this auxiliary space of our monodromy. Right, but this is not all we're limited to. We can construct a bunch more. So for the moment, we'll talk about some quite straightforward ones. Uh, so T K of U, uh, which is just constructed by taking traces is over anti-symmetric uh, products of this G. So graphically, it's kind of nice to represent this like this. So if I look at, for example, uh, T2, then, so I have two monodromies, with the same physical spaces, the twist each, and then I anti-symmetrize over the auxiliary spaces, okay? And then take the trace. Okay, and I can repeat a similar uh, procedure uh, for, for TK, uh, where K is running from one to N. Okay, and all these conserved charges commute, which is kind of the defining property of an integrable system. Sorry, before you erase, let me take a screenshot and try to share the file. Maybe it will work. Okay. Let's see how it works. So maybe if I stand somewhere better, you can get a better picture because I'm kind of blocking the light a bit. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Okay. All right. So we have, have a, we've constructed all of these commuting conserved charges. Now we want to really go and diagonalize them. So we want to construct eigenvectors, and we want to find their eigenvalues. So I'll go now to here. So luckily enough, eigenvalues are pretty straightforward to find. We have lots of techniques for this. So let's try and split this up like this maybe. So one nice way to find eigenvalues uh, comes from the Baxter version. Which isn't necessarily perfect, but for what I want to talk about, it will be Quite nice. So, what is the Baxter equation? So, for SU, this thing is an nth order finite difference equation with n linearly independent solutions. So, if you actually write down what it looks like, it looks like this. So, we have some big sum from k equals zero to n minus one to the a. And then our transfer matrices, the conserved charges, times some shift operator, which just moves the spectral parameter. And this has some independent solutions, uh, qi, which are the Baxter Q functions, and this is all equal to zero. So as soon as you introduce Q functions into the game, uh, things become very nice. So from here, you could start looking at analytical beta ansatz. Uh, of our transfer matrices, more Q functions, and looking at a Q system, uh, which is Sorry, also just a question. Just a question. Should there be a KV in the shift as well? Uh, yes, absolutely. It's okay. All right. So we have this. Um, so this is all nice. So the spectrum here is quite nice, but this. Construction doesn't really tell us much about eigenvectors, which if we want to look at form factors and scalar products, we really need eigenvectors. So is there any way we can kind of use this to get access to those kind of quantities? Well, I guess the main theme of this talk is separation of variables. So to kind of explain how this has anything to do with separating variables in a wave function for a spin chain, uh, let's, whoops, that's not good. 
let's just try and fix this up slightly. Let's spam some more duct tape. Next time we can try blue tag. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, and a little bit more for the tiger. Okay, hopefully this works. Well, now it's slightly lopsided. Uh, it's fine. Okay, so I'm going to take a slight detour on what separation of variables means for a classical integrable model and how this uh, will kind of tell us something, hopefully, about separation of variables for a quantum system. Okay? Are there any questions at this point? Right, so when we take this uh, quantum spin chain, there exists some well-defined classical limit, which I won't really go into much. All that's really important is that our operators T i j of u, which were previously uh, operators in our Hilbert space, become functions on space space. Right. So, what does it mean to have separation of variables in a classical integral model? So, for a system with, say, d degrees of freedom. I'll be very loose about what I mean by degrees of freedom. So classically, of course, this is all well defined. Once we go to the quantum setting, degrees of freedom is a bit of a shaky subject. So let's not dwell too much on this. So if it's uh, classically integral, I have d independent conserved charges, f1 up to fd, uh, which commute with each other. And if I have separation of variables, it means I can find some canonically conjugate variables, xi and pi. Uh, which satisfy canonical Poisson brackets with each other and the other usual ones. And so, so what it means to have separation of variables in a classical system really means that the equations of motion uh, simplify drastically and well, separate in a literal sense. So the equations of motion become D equations relating uh, my XA, my PA, and all my conserved charges, uh, which is equal to zero. And A will run from one to D. So you can see that all these are naturally separated, right? I've got a single equation relating each of my uh, XA and PAs together with all of my conserved charges. And in principle, you could then go and solve this. And practice that might be the easiest thing to do, but whatever, that's not really what we're interested in here. So for this, classical version of the SUN spin chain, uh, things work out very, very nicely. And things are actually very closely related to this Baxter equation. So yeah, so I'll erase again. Do you want to take a picture or? Yes. Done. All right. Okay. So this classical analog of the spin chain has access to this so-called classical spectral curve, which is just the usual characteristic equation uh, for, for the monitoring matrix or the determinant. And we have some eigenvalue lambda, which depends on u, because the monitoring matrix depends on u, uh, which is equal to 0. And what you show is that this is actually generating function for all of the classically conserved charges. Uh, which looks strikingly similar uh, to the Baxter equation. So we'll have k equals 0 to n minus 1 to k, and then all right. So these tk's are kind of the classical analog of the transfer matrices I mentioned before which generates a maximum number of integrals of motion for the classical model and Poisson commute and so on. So if you look at this, you realize that this kind of already has uh, the shape 
of a separated equation, right? So we have some function, which depends on, okay, depends on you, depends on our eigenvalue uh, of the monitoring matrix, together with a bunch of conserved charges. So it may be possible to massage this in some way to get uh, a separated equation of motion. And this is exactly uh, the classical analog of Skyland's procedure. So what Skyland tells us is the following. Well, Skyland, among others, uh, historically it's associated with Skyland. So what Skyland tells us to do is to construct some big function on the phase space, which is called B, which you construct in terms of all of these TIJs. So I'm not going to write down an explicit formula uh, because it gets a bit messy. Maybe later that would be a bit useful, but for the moment I won't. So it's just some polynomial function in TIJs, which since it's polynomial, it has roots. So let's say A equals one to D u minus x a. So it has some functions as its roots. And Skyland's procedure and construction tells us that these roots are actually uh, separated coordinates. And that the conjugate momenta is related to these separated coordinates in the following way. So we take an eigenvalue. and evaluate it at x, and we get the exponent of the canonical conjugate momentum. And immediately you see that once you plug uh, u as x into this equation, you immediately get a separated equation, right? So this is going to become exponent of conjugate momentum. This will be conserved charges, and u will be replaced by separated uh, coordinates. So we'll have immediately a different equations, uh, where A runs from one to degrees of freedom, relating our separated coordinates, our conserved charges, and our conjugate momenta. So this is immediately a good uh, separated equation. The only thing left to check is that this X and this P, which are defined in this way, have uh, good Poisson brackets, and you can actually check this. So classically, everything is nice and dandy, but what can we say about uh, quantization? So if we perform a kind of naive quantization procedure uh, in the usual way, so let's say quantization, Then we promote everybody to operators on our Hilbert space. So x become some operators, and our p becomes, let's say, minus i d x a. And the moment you make this replacement and plug in here, uh, you get immediately the Baxter equation. So I'll label this as, say, one to make things clear. Because you see now the eigenvalues were originally exponent of PA. This becomes exponent of minus I times derivative, which becomes shift operator. So immediately we get the Baxter equation. So this kind of suggests that in a good separated coordinate system, the Baxter equation is sort of an analog of a separated Schrodinger equation. And we know that the solutions of the Baxter equation are Q functions. So this would at least naively suggest to us that in some separated coordinate bases, Q functions should be our wave functions. Okay. Any questions? No questions? All right. So this quantization procedure and this construction uh, in the quantum case was actually done by Swinon for, uh, for both SU, uh, SU2 and SU3. The problem with the SU3 case is that things don't really work too nicely for compact representations. And another problem is that even, when, even if you look at principal series representations or some infinite dimensional setting, it's not immediately clear, once you have these separated variables, how to actually construct um, the wave functions uh, using these coordinates. So this is now what I'm going to go to. So this was kind of an unanswered question for uh, something like 30 years, maybe. 
uh, on Phil paper in 2016 by Colian, Federer, and Grigori, where they showed actually how to explicitly do this construction using a quantum analog of this B operator um, for SC1 spin chains. And I'll now tell you how that worked. Uh, so I guess I'll erase. Yep. All right. All right. So historically, uh, the main tool that people have used to construct the eigenstates for these higher rank SU and spin chains uh, has been the nested beta ansatz. And this is all fine, everything works, but to really put this thing into practice is not a fun game to play, let's put it like this. And we'd really like to try and find something better. So. What Colian, Federer, and Gregory showed was that if you take a quantum analog of this B operator, so the classical one gets promoted to a quantum version, uh, which was explicitly constructed uh, by Skynet. What they showed was the following. So let's just kind of remember how uh, the structure of beta roots goes for SE minus spin chains. So we have n minus one nodes on our Lincoln diagram. So here we have certain beta roots associated with this, so Q1. We have more beta roots associated with this, Q12. And here we have Q12 uh, up to N minus one, which are so the roots of these things. So if we look at this one, this is a product from K equals one to M U minus UK. And these are the momentum carrying beta roots uh, for the spin chain in the fundamental representation. And the rest of the Q function described the auxiliary roots, which appears uh, at the next level and further the next level of nesting in the beta and equations. So what they were actually able to show was that instead of writing down a complicated recursive procedure using all of these nested uh, beta roots and having to diagonalize spin chains of lower rank and lower rank and lower rank, what they showed was that directly one could construct uh, the eigenstates of the conserved charges. So if we have, so we want to diagonalize all of these conserved transfer matrices with some eigenvalue. What they showed was that this could be constructed directly by applying the quantum analog of this V operator evaluated at the roots from the first level of lesson in the beta analysis equations. So you don't need to go to uh, low, deeper and deeper levels in the equations. You just need to look at the first level, the momentum carrying roots applied to the spin chain vacuum site. Okay, and this is kind of very, very nice and very, very elegant. And what kind of happens here is that because, uh, if I remind you that this B operator is a polynomial, say in it, of order D, where D is degrees of freedom, and I don't really want to specify what degrees of freedom means for the moment. There won't hat on B, right? Uh, yes, I probably want hat on B. And I'm probably going to forget that as I go. So I made notational changes for a whiteboard talk to make things a bit clearer, but I'll probably forget this as I go. Uh, so these are also operators, right? So you can just rearrange this. product of Q1 of XA acting on this vacuum. And then if you were somehow able to go and construct uh, the eigenbasis of B, so the eigenstates of this these operators X, then immediately in this basis, uh, this wave function is going to factorize into a product of two functions. So we'll have that x psi is just a product from a equals one to d of q1 of xa. 
Yeah, so one maybe uh, could add that this B is a not, not too complicated combination of the transfer matrix elements. So it's quite explicit actually, this B. Yes. And uh, then uh, this formula for the eigenstate uh, replaces what is uh, what existed before as a nested uh, B times that, right? Construction of Rishitikin and so on, which is like recur recursive relation uh, where you decrease the rank one by one of SUN to SUN minus one and so on, and at each level you construct the wave function in the uh, coordinate way. So which involves at the end all, all levels of uh, B times that equation and uh, has like a billion of terms, right? So it's like n factorial terms, so whereas this one has only one term at the end. So uh, secretly, uh, though, uh, it must know about the auxiliary better equations somehow. So once you know uh, the actual B beta roots, you can construct auxiliary beta equations, but you never actually compute them because uh, you construct the momentum carrying beta roots by solving Baxter equation, right? And this is a self-contained procedure. You never need to know the auxiliary roots. So auxiliary roots you can compute after if you want, but. Nice. But don't the uh, don't, uh, momentum carrying roots uh, depend on the auxiliary roots as well? No. Like, they give they you some uniquely, solution? They, they uniquely determine the state. So once you have a set of momentum carrying roots, it uniquely determines your state. Oh, I see. So you go in another direction. Okay. Thanks. All right. So I guess this slide is finished. All right, so are there any more questions while I'm taking this screenshot, which takes forever? Um, maybe just a small comment. So in, in usual pay transats, the complexity is exponential. I, th I think it's not exactly factorial. But anyway. I don't log difference. Right? Yeah, for this construction, complexity is linear with the B. <laughs> Yes, indeed. It's much more compact and much more kind of user friendly to implement on something like Mathematica. Okay, I've done. Okay, so this is all fine, but in principle, to really do this and show that all this works, you really need to compute, uh, or at least you would like to understand better, uh, these left eigenstates which factorize uh, or which diagonalize this B operator. And you can kind of brute force this, but this is not very illuminating and it's kind of difficult to see algebraically how all of this is working. And then Maya Nicoli came on the scene in 2018 with a very nice paper kind of explaining how to do this in general, how you would write down or construct a separated variable basis for basically any model you like, uh, finite dimensional and even some infinite dimensional uh, quantum mechanical systems. And when you see it written down, you kind of think, how did nobody think of this uh, before now? Uh, but alas, no one did. Uh, and this is what happens. So we want to take a finite dimensional uh, quantum mechanical system, uh, which is integrable in some well-defined sense. So we have uh, our Hamiltonian and a bunch of conserved charges, which I'll write J1 up to JD, and maybe you want to take the Hamiltonian to be the first of these. Okay, and these are all mutually commuting, diagonalizable, and so on. So what we really want to do is add uh, the wave function of these operators. We want to construct uh, the eigenstate such that this is an eigenstate. Uh, maybe K is a better letter for blackboard purposes. So they have some eigenvalue lowercase j subscript k. So a very easy way to do this is to take some left reference covector, which we denote by zero, and act by various products of these conserved charges on this state. So let's take a product from a from one to d, the number of them that we have, and let's take j. Uh, let's say. A and then some integer power MA. 
All right. So if this happens to generate a basis, which will actually be the case if the number of charges is maximal, which can be shown, then what's going to happen is that the moment we try to compute uh, this overlap, then this expression is immediately going to factorize. So we're going to get a product from A from 1 to D of J A to some power M A. And we can normalize uh, this expression so that there's the overlap of this 0 with the eigenstate is equal to 1. And so we're just left with exactly this, which immediately manifestly factorizes, right? So we could actually denote this expression by the powers of these operators and write it as something like this. Uh, let's see. So this constitutes a separated variable basis. And all you need to know are the knowledge of your conserved chart. So you take your conserved charges, you act on some reference state, immediately your wave functions are going to factorize in this basis, which is kind of universal. So now it's been applied to uh, XSX spin chain rather universally, but it's also been applied to the Hubbard model uh, in, albeit in a slightly more simplified manner, but it, it also works there. Okay, so how do we apply all this to the spin chain? How do we apply all this to this, uh, these separated variables constructed from this V operator? And how do we relate it to these transfer matrices which actually generate all of our conserved charges? All right. So what my and Coley were able to show for SU2 was that they were able to construct the basis which diagonalizes this B operator uh, in the following very simple way. So they wrote X as some vacuum state with a product of A equals one to L, which is the length of the spin chain. And then our fundamental transfer matrices evaluate that spin chain uh, in homogeneities to some power uh, MA, where MA is either zero or one. And this diagonalizes this B operator. So all right. And they showed numerically for some small number of states that this actually works for higher rank as well. But for higher rank, it kind of becomes a bit more complicated because the complexity of this B operator really kind of increases as you increase the rank. And these kind of brute force techniques don't really work. So in a paper with myself and Dima Holden, we showed how to kind of put this on a more sounder, uh, firmer algebraic uh, setting or footing. I'm so, sorry, uh, what is uh, x in this formula on the right-hand side? Uh, on the right-hand side? You have, you have a, in, the, in the second bottom line, you have a t of theta. And on the left-hand side, you have an x. Is the x related to the thetas? Uh, yes, so you, what you could write is that, so this is going to be a product, this is going to be, so x is going to be, so this, these label the eigenvalues of separated variables. So for this case, we have L of them. So x1 up to xL. And in this case, uh, we'll have xk is theta k plus i, and then whatever this integer number is here. Okay. Uh, ma. Uh, sorry, ma. Yeah, so I just use x to denote the fact that this is a separated coordinate basis weight uh, eigenstate. Thanks. All right. Coley, do you want to take a picture? Any more questions while I'm taking the pictures? So can I ask a question? Yes. yes. So in, the, in that finite dimensional quantum mechanical system example, uh, I understand that like you can get the factorized wave function, but uh, can you also like uh, is there also a systematic way of like writing down a resolution of identity or completeness relation? Uh, no, absolutely not. And that's kind of an ongoing thing which we're working on. So constructing the measure in this basis is actually definitely more complicated than writing down the wave functions themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Do, do uh, Maye and uh, Nicole have uh, an expression? for the measure uh, the, the, their last paper i think they announced something like this but i'm not sure that uh, i understood uh, their result 
they do write down an explicit uh, expression for the measure uh, for the case of SU3 spin change and fundamental representation, uh, which is more or less using the same procedure they've done before. So they construct a left separate variable basis like this for SU3, and then construct an analogous uh, basis for uh, the right uh, wave functions. Uh, but they have two different two different constructions. So one of them uses the essentially uses the basis that we constructed in our SU3 paper, and some slight issue there is that the, the measure isn't actually not diagonal; it's explicitly off diagonal with some mixing between off diagonal states. Uh, they also have this problem, but they also construct a different separated variable basis for left and right eigenstates, uh, which is explicitly uh, has a diagonal measure. But in order to do this, they have to introduce kind of auxiliary transfer matrices, which are not the usual transfer matrices which you would have, but they construct them in an explicit way in order to have a diagonal measure. Okay, thanks. To add, uh, maybe to add a small comment. So in the first approach where they uh, build the same basis as we do, they do not actually have an explicit result for the measure. But uh, in, in the second approach, the measure is uh, almost trivial, but uh, instead the wave functions have a non-trivial form and they are not the usual few functions. Yes, absolutely, this is true. The wave functions become very complicated in the second basis, but the offshoot is that you get the diagonal measurement. All right. Maybe I should mention that uh, in in our basis we actually have some explicit, I mean, some workable expression for the measure, right? From which you can extract all elements quite easily. Yeah. So we're able to show that we can construct uh, this basis in this way, and so even though the measure is actually not diagonal, it's equivalent. The whole construction is equivalent to a functional uh, construction for scalar products, uh, which in principle allows one to easily extract uh, the matrix elements of the measure explicitly. All right, so the next thing I'd like to say uh, is how to combine this approach of diagonalizing this B operator and how to construct the separated variable basis by action uh, of transfer matrices or conserved charges into kind of a single framework. And the way to unify these into a single framework comes from a slightly unexpected area, something you wouldn't necessarily expect. It comes from taking a singular limit uh, of the XXX spin chain and taking the transfer matrices and conserved charges in this limit to generate some new algebra which by itself defines some integrable system, um, but is closely related to the separated variables. And this thing is called kelfan seitan algebra. So what this is, uh, as I said, corresponds to a uh, singular degenerate limit of the XXX main chain. So if you remember how we constructed all of our transfer matrices, right, so we took some trace uh, of the twisted monodromy and T2 was something similar, right? So we took a similar trace over some anti uh, symmetrized products. All right, so to get from these transfer matrices to the scale fan state algebra, we use a particular twist. So we take our twist matrix to be diagonal with eigenvalues Z1, Z2, Zn, zero everywhere else, and then take a limit where uh, Z1 becomes much, much bigger than Z2, which is much, much bigger than Z3, and so on, which is much, much bigger uh, than Zn. Of course, this ordering is a choice, but it's kind of a convenient choice. So what happens in this is of the so-called gelfand seitlin algebra, so this TK of U, uh, becomes what we denote as GTK. And these things, of course, inherit the commutativity properties of these transfer matrices and by themselves form a commutative family of operators. And as I said, these by themselves also define some notion of an integral system. All the techniques you're familiar with from integral systems apply to this, uh, this limit uh, algebra, the skeleton state in algebra. You can do beta ansatz for this model. You can do uh, TQ relation. You can do QQ relation and so on. You can do more or less anything you like. And the beauty of this model is that it's an integral system where the beta roots and all related things are immensely simple. So if you took XXX spin chain and tried to compute uh, the beta roots explicitly, 
you would have a very, very hard time. Uh, with this model, all beta roots uh, drastically simplify and they come up the form inhomogeneity plus some integer. And that's the end of it. So what does this thing have to do with separation of variables? Uh, well, actually, it's the following. So what Dima and I showed uh, in our first paper on this topic was that in a special basis, the B operator for SUN becomes of a very simple form. You get a product of these gelfand satan generators. So U plus I n minus two, uh, this is two, this should be n minus one, plus some explicit upper triangular nilpotent operator. So what this means, the presence of this nilpotent operator, which is strictly upper triangular in this basis, so the skeleton satan algebra can be diagonalized. It has non-degenerate spectrum. It means the eigenvalues of B, or equivalently the eigenvalues of the separated variables, uh, are labeled by the eigenvalues of the skeleton satan algebra, which is the degenerate singular limit of the XXX model. And its eigenvalues and eigenvectors are very well understood. And what we can actually show is that the separated variables constitute a continuous deformation away from the eigenvectors of the skeleton satan algebra. Okay, so everything is kind of very well under control. We can take certain limits where this important part actually disappears and we get an equivalence. Okay, so all you have to do really is look up some math literature. You can, uh, for example, Alexander Molev has done a lot of work on this, this Gulf and Satan stuff. Uh, in his book by Yanians, he explicitly writes down all the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this Gulf and Satan system. And what we know from this is that the eigenvalues of this will also label the eigenvalues of our separated variables, and things can kind of come uh, very, very well under control. We look at this. Okay, uh, so I'll erase this if Koi wants to take a picture and people can ask questions in the meantime. Any questions? Uh, my, one question is what with these Gelfand cycling operators, are they more degenerate than the B hat operator? I would say that I would expect that they, the sum degeneracy will be lifted when you go away from the limit. Mm. So the degeneracy is actually the same. So unfortunately, so the spectrum of these individual Gelfand Satan generators is non-degenerate. All right. Uh, a problem arises when you start to take products because products naturally contain much less information uh, than the individual factors themselves. But there is a way to show, and actually this could introduce problems because it may be the case that this no potent part has some non-trivial uh, Jordan block structure and maybe even breaks the diagonalizability uh, of this B operator. Unfortunately, this is not the case. Uh, we have tools to show that uh, this B operator is diagonalizable using uh, this technology, and furthermore, show that there is indeed a one-to-one -one correspondence between the eigenvectors of this and the eigenvectors of the individual generators. Okay, thanks. Is the dispersion relation the same in this limit? Um, No, definitely not. So things are going to simplify quite a bit. So by dissertion relation, you mean what the explicit form of the beta equation, right? So you have this e to the ip factor, and this is uh, some f metric factor. No, I just meant what's the energy of the states in this limit? Uh, so you, you know, you have some particular solution with I don't know five beta roots, and how much does each one contribute to the energy? All right. So, but um, so you really want an explicit expression for the. Yeah, you know, I guess maybe I would like to understand physically what this limit means. Yeah, so this is not particularly well defined. So, for example, if you take, you can construct the twisted Hamiltonian uh, in this way, and you can try to take this limit, but the Hamiltonian does not respond very well to taking this limit. What does not respond very well mean? Well, it's not, it's not well defined. You can't really take it. So, you'll have, so if you write down the Hamiltonian explicitly. So what is it diverges or what? Uh, some, yeah, that's the problem. So some entries of the Hamiltonian diverge, some entries go to zero. It doesn't seem to be a particularly nice way to regularize it. Sorry, but at the end you are going to use this construction to actually deal with the initial system, not uh, the single. Yes, model. exactly. Yes, I'm not going to view this as an individual system by itself. I'm just going to use it as an intermediate technical tool. 
So the, spe it. the spectrum he will be dealing with is uh, the same as in the beginning, nothing changed. There's just uh, some uh, auxiliary construction. Okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll deal with diagonalizing and constructing the wave function for the original model where I don't take this limit. This is just an intermediate step to simplify constructions. Okay. Well, so I, I can't, I can't think it. of it as, I can't think of it in terms of what's happening in the spin chain itself, right? Yeah, that's probably not. It's good just some auxiliary mathematical yeah. exercise. Exactly. Well, this, okay. these are like chemical potentials, so you, yeah. you kind of have huge chemical potentials, and they're yeah. bigger and well. bigger when you go up. So, well, so <laughs> that means um, let me see. So taking this limit is really just kind of physical motivation on how to actually introduce these operators. So when you construct B in this special basis that I mentioned, you explicitly get these operators, but these can be introduced or defined as a limit of the original beta algebra. So we're not actually taking the original, we're not actually trying to diagonalize the beta algebra in this limit. It's just a technical, this limit is just a technical instruction to define these operators in some physical sense. But I guess, what, well, I guess what happens in this limit, if you just yeah. consider this as an actual physical Hamiltonian, that beta roots at different levels, they will, uh, decouple from each other essentially. Mm, there is still some constraints between them. So actually what you can show, um, well actually I'll get to it later. I don't want to introduce the, the thing now. Um, there is still some dependence between the beta roots at different uh, levels of mass thing, but it's much more, um, much less constrained. Okay, okay maybe, maybe uh, you just, uh, I, I will, I will, yeah, thanks. Okay, all right. Yeah, sorry, I only have one whiteboard. It would kind of be nice if I convinced my girlfriend to get this paint where you can write whiteboard on the wall. Um, but I doubt she'll be too happy. Uh, all right, so to really kind of understand the power of this girlfriend Satan algebra, we need to go beyond uh, fundamental representation uh, for the spin chain. So generic representations, uh, finite dimensional irreducible representations of SUN are labeled by Young diagrams. So I have lambda which is some young diagram lambda one up to lambda n and we draw it in the usual way so to fix my convention if I look at the young diagram 210 I'm writing it like this okay so what's nice about this is oh well really what's nice about this Gelfand Satan Aldera is that it's uh, eigenvalues are very, very closely related uh, to the weights of the spin chain in a very, very natural way. So it's probably better to do an explicit example. So if I take, say, SU4 spin chain, and let's pick, uh, actually, let's do generic for the moment. So we have, say, one site is in the representation lambda 2, lambda 3, and lambda 4. Then all eigenvalues of the scale can in algebra are determined by these so-called gelfand Salen patterns. So I put my weights, the highest weight, the spin chain on top, and then I fill in a kind of triangular array below it. Uh, here I put what I call mu11. Here I put what I call mu22. Here I put mu33. Here I put mu21. Here I put mu 3 2 and here I put mu 3 3 uh, sorry 3 1 so if you've seen Gelfand Satan stuff before and you think what well, when people normally use uh, for labeling Gelfand Satan patterns uh, but in the context of separation of variables which we're doing this uh, labeling is considerably more convenient okay so the labeling is like this so here we have one one by itself. Here we have two one and two two. And here we have three one, three two, and three three. And there are some rules on these numbers. So each entry here is going to be some integer. And there are some rules which determine uh, a state in the representation. So literally the rules are as you read the diagram. So mu one one has to be between lambda one and lambda two. Mu two two has to be between lambda two and lambda three. Mu three three has to be between lambda three and lambda four. 
and then mu2 one has to lie between mu11 one one and mu2 two, and so on. You just fill in uh, the diagram using all possible constraints like this. So for example, if we look at uh, the adjoint representation of SU3, which has the highest weight, two, one, zero. So we fill in two, one, zero on top, and then look at all possible ways we can fill up the rest of the triangle. So we need to put some number between two and one, so let's put two. Some number between one and zero, we can put one, and some number between two and one, so again, we can put two, okay? And similarly, we could look at two, one, zero. We could maybe put one here, we could put one here, maybe put one here. Okay, so you just fill up all possible arrays, and when you do this, you'll get exactly eight possible patterns, which is exactly the dimension of the adjoint representation uh, of SU3. So the counting at least seems to work. And the eigenvalues of these gelfand satan generators uh, are almost exactly, the or, well, are exactly determined by the eigenvalues um, or by the labels on this pattern. So we had this GT1, the first one is a polynomial of degree L. So for the moment, actually, I'll look at length one. It's kind of makes it a bit clear what's happening. So this will be polynomial of degree one, which is u minus theta minus i, and then this number. The second one is, well, has as its roots these two numbers, right? The second row. So u minus theta minus i mu two one u minus theta minus i mu three two and so on. So gt three will have as its roots uh, this, this, and this, and so on for any rank you like. Okay. So what actually we end up showing is that there is a bijection between each of these nodes on this pattern and the separated variable eigenvalues of the XXX spin chain. So it will have a family of separated variables, each separated variable associated to a node on the pattern. And by knowing uh, the values of each pattern, we can read off the eigenvalues of the separated variables. So let, right. let, me, let me try just to summarize right, uh, at this point. So you have this auxiliary uh, GTs, right? Which are mm -hmm. constructed by taking this extreme limit of um, the twist. And then to diagonalize them, you label the eigenstates of the GTs by this uh, lambda and mu, which satisfy certain inequalities. So for yes. any set of integers which satisfies this inequality, there is an eigenstate of the GT1, GT2. So now we don't really care about the GT1 because it is a non-physical limit of the physical system. However, you can use the GT1s to uh, construct B. And so actual eigenstates of the GTs are eigenstates of B, and so these are the separated variables. Right? So in yes. other words, these axes are kind of uh, usual states of, this, of, the, of the initial system, but in this extreme limit. Right? Yes. Yes, exactly. All right, so should I take a screenshot and uh, time for questions? Yes. Any question? So maybe can you comment uh, what's the relation to the Maya construction? Yes, this is exactly what I'm going to do now. This will be the next part of the talk. So to kind of uh, uh, so in principle, you have 20 minutes, right? Just to let you know. Yes. OK. <laughs> Well, you ask you ask a lot of questions, right? So that adds like another half an hour, right? So. <laughs> right. So this Maya inequality construction says that we should be able to construct uh, a separated variable basis uh, by acting uh, with some transfer matrices, so TK, uh, with some rapidity, so say inhomogeneity um, plus something. Okay. 
And in principle, we're not really limited to just these TKs, right? So these are transfer matrices constructed from taking the trace uh, of the auxiliary space uh, in some anti-symmetric representation. But in principle, we have any irreducible representation we like. So we could just as well construct some irreducible representation labeled by some Young diagram mu. And then we would take products over these mu's. We could act by some product of these transfer matrices in any irreducible representation we like uh, to construct some eigenvectors. Sorry, this should be zero. And now we start to think, right, well, if these are eigenvectors of this B operator, as Maillet and Nicoli suggest, and we know that the eigenstates of the B operators are actually labeled by these Gelkenstein patterns, these triangles of numbers, then there should be some relation telling us how mu, which we act on with our transfer matrix, creates different eigenstates of the B operator. So this mu label on the transfer matrix should be somehow linked to the mu's that we had populating up uh, the Gelfand-Satan pattern. And it turns out to be remarkably simple. So to skip unnecessary technical details, so let's look at an example. Let's take this state zero. So zero is the lowest weight state of the representation, which corresponds to the pattern where everybody is at its minimal value. So let's take SU. Let's say three, three, one. So no one says I have to put the last one to zero. So let's say three, 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 one, and then we fill up in the minimal possible way for the lowest weight state. So we have one here, we have one here, uh, we have one here, one, one, and uh, one. Is this correct? Uh, yes, this is correct. Okay. So what Dima and I showed was we derived a commutation relation between B and these transfer matrices to try and tell us how to uh, relate mu, uh, which acts on the vacuum, to how it relates to filling up these patterns. And to do a simple example to show how this works, so let's take this zero and act with two one zero. All right. And we have theta plus i. So the reason we have i is that we always shift uh, by whatever the lowest number on the pattern is. So if we had zero here, we would just have theta, which corresponds to this Maillet construction, uh, which I mentioned earlier. In principle, if we have some non-trivial central charge, it corresponds to just shifting uh, in homogeneity. This isn't really important. Okay. So what this does is takes us to the following pattern. It's three, 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 one, one. This never changes. These numbers also never change because they're constrained by each other. Similarly, the only number we can put between three and three is three, three, and three. And now what we end up with is, uh, so I want to put one here and then three, uh, wrong way. So I want to put two here. Sorry, what am I doing? Yes. Okay. Yes, this is correct. Okay. So we take two the young diagram two, one, and zero. We act with it. And all that happens is we fill up. Excuse me. You fill yeah. Three be below three and two. Um, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't obey the rule. I, I would say instead of one two three, I would say one uh, three two one. Uh, second diagonal would be reversed. It'll be reversed. No. Uh, uh, sorry, here you mean? Uh, no, on the. Diagonal, the second, the second diagonal. Wow. So you have one diagonal which is just once. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. No. The the the, the reverse diagonal. Ah, this, like this. Yeah. Yeah. And then the and then I would put uh, one. No. The, the, yeah. One there, two and three. Mm. 
No. Uh, so I don't see a problem with this. So the constraints are that this should be like this should be less than or equal to what I have here. This one should be greater than uh, or equal to what I have here. Greater than or equal to. Uh, so as far as I can see, everything works. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, maybe this one is causing some issue. So I'll erase one and replace it with zeros to make things uh, slightly more better. Okay, so there's no counting issues. So zero, zero. Okay, this is slightly better. And here I have, this was going to be, let's erase all this as well. Okay, much better. Right, so I act with two, one, zero, and what I'm going to get is so here I have three, here I'll have two, one, and here I'll have uh, zero, zero, and zero. So this is the same, but everybody is now shifted down by one, and this is this is completely consistent. You still have some one left over in the bottom of the first picture. This. So could you tell again uh, in a quote? So it decreases along the diagonal and then, and yeah. So let's use just some yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, like this. So it is both di along diagonal, they should decrease and also horizontally, right? Yes, yeah, so in this direction, they have to, uh, in this direction, they have to decrease. In this direction, they have to decrease. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right, so, so the action of the yeah. Sorry? Now the t of theta instead of theta plus i because the lowest value you have in your. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes, it should be theta. So we can see that this trend, this uh, Young diagram 210 acts by filling up uh, the first available diagonal of zeros with 2 and 1. Okay. And then we might try and act again. So now we can act with another transfer matrix. Let's say we stick on, uh, let's say, what's a good diagram to use. Let's just put something simple. Let's say this one, right? Uh, actually, maybe red is not the best color. So just FYI, all colors are black for us. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Like this. So transfer matrix in, in, in symmetric representation with two boxes. So what this does, uh, it does it the nicest possible way. It just takes the next available diagonal of zeros and fills it in again with the numbers of the own diagram. So I get this. Okay. No, so, can, yes. Can you add numbers next to the diagrams as well? So we, we, we can, so two, two, one, zero and what uh, next one? Uh, yes. So what are your conventions? Two, one, zero. And this one is two, zero, zero. Okay. So the numbers of the Young diagram just fill in the available row of zeros on the Galpin statement pattern. Okay, and everything works very, very nicely if you restrict to classes of representations which look, which look like this. Uh, the moment you go away from this class of representation, you immediately start to have some problems. So the first representation where things start to go wrong. Uh, so for bad representation. Uh, is two one zero, right? So we have Gelfand state on patterns which look like this. The vacuum state is again the lowest configuration. So like good. Uh, sorry, so, uh, by good, you, your definition of good is uh, those which can be done with uh, Maya Nicoli, right? Yes. So just by applying keys to some vacuum state, I fill up everything. Mm -hmm. So for this representation, I'm actually going to have problems. So, so from political uh, reasons, I would reverse uh, your definition of good and bad. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, so we can try again to fill up uh, all, all of our available uh, entries by using transfer matrices. So if we apply, say, whatever transfer matrix we like to fill up this to an allowed pattern, everything will work. The problem comes when we try to excite this one. So there is one number here, and all it can be is either one or two. So we can try various different combinations of one or two or transfer matrices with, say, two, one, zero, or two, zero, zero, and so on. This won't work. We can try transfer matrices with different shifts. This also won't work. It seems that using this construction, there is no way to get from this diagram, uh, or this state, uh, to the state where we have two, one, zero, uh, two, zero, zero. OK? Uh, this doesn't seem to work. Uh, then we kind of have this idea to pretend that this is already excited. So we know that everything works nicely when we have lots of zeros trailing around. But this isn't zero. We have zero here. This is very much different from zero. So what we try to do is to pretend that this is already excited. So to bring it back down to, say, imagine we introduce some new state, uh, zero tilde, uh, such that, uh, let's say, zero is omega tilde times transfer matrix in anti-symmetric representation inverted. So we can imagine that this, uh, by following this procedure, this has the action of reducing this one and one back down to a zero, zero. So this is not an allowed state. There is no state, uh, eigenstate of the Gelfand state in algebra, which has uh, a pattern which looks like this. Uh, sorry, like uh, this one would look like two, zero, 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 zero. There is no state which has this as a pattern for this representation, but we can pretend it exists. So what we can do then is to take, um, take this thing as a new vacuum and then excite in the usual way. So we want to bring this back up to 210. So we can take this, we can act with, uh, do I have some ordering issue here? Yeah, maybe if you want to take a picture, I can go back to the top and it becomes a bit easier to do. All right, so any questions at this point? So to clarify a bit, what you call the good states are when you start from the part, uh, when the first row is some uh, identical numbers and then zeros. Yes. Uh, and then by, uh, it means that the whole left part will be filled with this number and the right part will be filled with zeros. Yes, exactly. Uh, so that's what you call a good initial state. But for this representation to one zero, this, uh, uh, so it does not fit in that criterion. Yes, exactly, exactly. All right. So that does it mean that uh, action of different T's on the state doesn't form a basis? That's what you're saying. Um, I don't necessarily want to say it doesn't form a basis, but it doesn't diagonalize B. Mm. But uh, if it does form a basis, then it will construct some kind of SOVs. Or, or... Yes, it will construct some kind of SOV basis. But whether or not this is a nice SOV basis or a natural one, a natural one would be one which diagonalizes some explicit operator we have. Mm -hmm. uh, this weird one would not necessarily be natural. So we take what I wanted to say, some new state, uh, this zero tilde. Uh, let me see. So I want to write. Uh, Yes, so I want to write, yes, this way. I want to write zero as being filling up this non-existent pattern with one, one, like I said before. So this thing would be roughly like two, zero, 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 zero. And this one is like two, one, zero, one, zero, zero. Okay, so what I can do now is take this stage and apply 210. So I want to take omega tilde and apply 210, which by our conventions and our rules should give us the state and 210200. And this actually works. So really what this is saying is that this state is equal to our original vacuum state acted on by this ratio. So 210 
over uh, anti-symmetric. And this actually works. So there, are, there is a procedure to show that this really does uh, uh, produce an eigenstate of the B operator, even though it's constructed as some uh, ratio like this. And of course, one also needs to know that these transfer matrices are actually invertible at the correct rapidity. Uh, this you can indeed also show, and everything works out. So since I'm, I guess I'm running out of time very, very quickly, I'll kind of just say one or two more words about how we actually get nice wave functions from this construction for any SUN spin tank. So, so transfer matrices admit this so-called Ronskian solution in terms of Q operators. So P of mu can be written as some determinant of I and J of Q operators uh, with some shift. All right, so this shift just means that uh, f of 2a is just uh, f of u plus a, all right, uh, divided by some q full set factor. So what you actually show is that if you take this ratio, some magic happens uh, between all the q operators and their q-q relations, and you end up showing that this, this ratio is precisely uh, a determinant a two by two determinant now. So previously, this uh, for SUN, this is three. All right, so I have QI and then some shift. So by taking the ratio, we actually end up using a Q operator expression for what looks like a transfer matrix for a GL2 spin chain instead of a GL3 spin chain. And then you kind of start to guess that if you look at bigger and bigger representations, in order to diagonalize B and construct our wave functions, do we need to start looking at transfer matrices, uh, Ronskin expression for transfer matrices for smaller and smaller and smaller spin chains? And the answer is yes. So if you want to take a picture for you, I'll write down my final slide. Mm -hmm. I need to find the shortcut next time. Yes. So if I write uh, T K of U, so the upper subscript tells me that my determinant uh, is restricted a little bit. So I'm going to get T K of U is determinant Q I with some shift over Q one two K. So what we can show is that for any SUN spin chain with any weights you like, different weights on any on different sides, anything you like, is that all of the separated variables can be constructed acting from this zero state. So I take a product uh, from A equals one to the L over the number of sides, a product from K equals two uh, to the N, and then I have these keys. So I have T, K, and then mu, and then a different A, a and some rapidity, which I don't care about. Um, the end result is that all the separated variables, uh, which make up B, is that we have a family of them x, a, k, j, which are related to the gulf and Seidman patterns in the following way, theta a plus i uh, mu a k uh, j minus j plus one, and these are Young diagrams with the components made up of mu kj. So mu a k is mu a k1 up to mu a k k. All right, so the Young uh, components of the Young diagram make up uh, the entries on the gulf and patterns, which are labeled by these transfer matrices, which are transfer matrices constructed by killing off part When you write out all these expressions using uh, Q operators, you get the following final result for the wave function. So X psi is the following product. So alpha, sorry, A is one, the L, K is two to the N, and then determined K, uh, Q, uh, I, X, 
a kj. So this is the wave function for any SUN spin chain uh, in any representation you like, um, which is considerably easier and nicer looking than anything you would get using the nested beta handsets. So once you finally have this expression, you can compare with uh, the expression for the measure, which we get from Ronskin formula. And we find that this expression for the wave function precisely matches what you would get uh, using this functional formalism. So from here, you can construct a separate set of separating variables uh, for the other, uh, for the left wave functions and try and write down the measure. And the results you get exactly match what you get from this newly developed uh, functional formalism. So at the end of the day, this is kind of the final result. Maybe, well. maybe you should say what the functional formalism is just a shortcut how to get to, to the result of, for the overlaps of wave functions in uh, SOV variables uh, straight from the Baxter equation without doing any anything basically. Yes, so I would like to start from the top of this. So do you want to take a picture of this then? And I'll say one or two words about that. Alright. So this functional formalism relies explicitly on the Baxter equation. So as I said before, the Baxter equation uh, is some finite uh, difference equation. So this denotes a finite difference operator, which has all of these shifts, shifts included in it, uh, which acts on my n and q functions, uh, and gives me zero. All right. We also have this dual Baxter equation, uh, which involves these dual q functions. Uh, so this is Baxter. We also have a dual Baxter, uh, which says that q with upper index, let's call it a, uh, and then our shift operator uh, acts like this, uh, is also equal to zero. And from here, uh, so just, uh, just to tell, uh, so the Baxter itself is a, an equation for the momentum carrying uh, Q functions, right? Baxter polynomials and the uh, dual Baxter is uh, for the nested Q functions, which are at the highest possible nesting level. So yes. It's like opposite to the yes. momentum carrying. So here we have like QI, uh, sorry. Uh, QI with lower index. Here we roughly have uh, QA. All right. So we can just construct some inner product on the space of these uh, Baxter functions, uh, which looks more like this. So if we have two functions, uh, F and G, we define the following inner product, which is not the same as the inner product uh, on the spin chain, uh, spin chain states. So we take some integration over some function. We have this F of U g of u, and then some uh, measure. Actually, we have j such measures, right? So j runs from 1 to l. The explicit form isn't particularly, doesn't particularly matter for the time being. All that matters is actually that it's i-periodic. And that this uh, inner product, uh, when you use this inner product, this Baxter operator is actually orthogonal with respect to this. So you get f All right, so from here, you can then construct uh, the following thing that this is going to be zero to you. And then I'm going to have uh, for Q, how do I want to do this? So Q A on some beta state A. Oh, this will be for stage say B, for stage A. Actually, the direction doesn't matter on the arrows, but maybe it's good to include uh, Q. I uh, is equal to zero uh, with some exponential factor, which I don't care. For the sake of the spin, all possible different A and B states. And we can write this using the fact that O is an explicit operator in terms of transfer matrix eigenvalues. We can compute these transfer matrix eigenvalues, which should be different for any uh, two distinct beta states. And this is going to give us an equation for. Uh, L times n minus one unknowns in L times n minus one coefficients, which appear in the transfer matrices. And from this, we can explicitly use this to construct uh, the measure explicitly. So when we do this, we find that 
uh, this looks like um, this implies that the wave functions, the overlap of two wave functions will be some some uh, some measure over some parameters x and y, and then we're going to have uh, this psi of x, psi of a and b dependent on x and y. So y doesn't matter, we can forget about this, but this psi of a of x is going to agree exactly with the wave function we wrote down for the spin chain using the separated variables using our cues. And so from this, we can compare exactly how the measure relates from this functional formalism to this operator construction of states as well. All right, so that's the end. Uh, yes, I guess I'm done. Thank you. Okay, so let's unmute and uh, upload. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow, there are many people. <laughs> right, so maybe a lot, let's uh, have uh, questions. Yes, I, I have. Uh, I have some questions. Yeah, let's let's mute mute except for those who is asking. Uh, can I ask the question? Uh, we mute first. Uh, yeah, so um, it, it looks like uh, there are many separated bases. Uh, since uh, anything you build from uh, um, uh, transfer matrices, products of transfer matrices will be separated bases. So uh, what uh, uh, the but but some of them some of these bases are better than others. Uh, for example, the fused uh, the, the basis that you get from uh, from uh, matrices with uh, uh, some uh, uh, representations in the auxiliary space so they, they are better than, than others. So can you can you comment on this? Because that that some, that was some uh, uh, Maye and Nicole wrote a paper to explain uh, uh, the difference between. Uh, just products of uh, transfer matrices and fused transfer matrices. Yeah. Uh, so what uh, what happens when you use the fused transfer matrices and uh, why this basic basis is better than the others? So there are kind of two views that one can take on this. Um, so I'll erase this, maybe make some comments. Probably do you have a picture of this already? Or? Yes. Okay. So at least in my inequalities construction, when they do uh, fundamental representation, really what they rely on in their construction uh, relates to the fusion properties of transfer matrices. So for example, if you look at SU2, so their basis in this case is constructed as vacuum state and then a product from A equals one to the L of T in the fundamental representation uh, as in homogeneity. Okay, so a lot of what they rely on uh, involves using the fusion relation between the transfer matrices. And the reason that they rely on this is, at least so it seems, is because they don't really have an explicit operator to diagonalize. So they're focusing more on a case of, okay, which is the best separated variable basis for our integral model at hand. So at least if you look at SU2 in this representation, then of course you have these fusion relations. Uh, for example, the Hirota equation, for example, in this case, if you evaluate at inhomogeneity, and then inhomogeneity uh, shifted, you get exactly the transfer matrix uh, in the anti-symmetric representation. Uh, yes, like this. Uh, plus I. And what's nice about this is that this thing, so it's some central element for the representation. Let's take some number values uh, function. So if you look at it like this, the reason why this kind of looks nice is because here T in fundamental looks a bit like a raising operator, and T in fundamental uh, like this looks a bit like uh, a lowering operator because when you act like this, you get something which just acts by the identity. Okay, and this is kind of what people would expect, right? Because if you remember that 
T in fundamental looks a bit like, uh, so you'd have in these conventions Q theta with a shift of I, and then Q1, 2, uh, sorry, this should be minus 2, plus Q theta, Q1 of minus 2, and Q1. So when you evaluate it in homogeneity, this term is going to vanish, and we'll be left with Q1, 2 over Q1. And when you act on some state, this kind of acts by raising, by raising Q1. So if you were to have a state which looked like, um, suppose it was just Q1, Q1, then this action is going to take one of the Q1s and replace it with a Q1 shifted. So it acts as a raising operator. Whereas if you look at this one, if you evaluate it at theta plus i, you're going to get something which acts roughly as a lowering operator. So in this sense, having knowing exactly how the transfer matrices together combined using the fusion relation uh, to give you something central so you can interpret this as a raising and lowering operator works out very useful. As soon as you start to use bigger and bigger transfer matrices, this becomes uh, considerably more complicated. So you'll always have this relation that you can act with transfer matrices and fundamental sufficiently many times to get back to the quantum determinant. And I think this is kind of the key idea that they use in their approach. Whereas we're not particularly bothered about this in our approach, we kind of more focus on diagonalizing B. So in this sense, using it like this is kind of very natural. Um, yeah, that would be roughly my interpretation of this. Uh, can I ask another question or? Uh... Oh, sorry, yes. just to, to add. So another criteria you also want to kind of smooth uh, match with classical limit, right? And um, that's obviously if you have this B of U, that's it guaranteed in this case. Yes, exactly. So if by focusing on B, you also get some nice classical interpretation, which makes everything this concept of separation of variables more, well, and slightly better pushing, right? If you can take some topical limit and things are still separated, things are kind of nice. Yes. So, so uh, can, am I allowed to ask another question? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, another point on which they are uh, they are uh, insisting is uh, about the completeness of the uh, better. Uh, Better equations and uh, are, are you able to generate uh, the or, or arguing? Uh, yes, sorry, they're more like not insistent, they're rather arguing whether it's com complete or not. Yes, yes, so, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I would like to, to hear from you about this, uh, this point. Well, I mean, we all know in our communities there are no questions about whether it's complete, right? No, we never... no, no, but uh, okay. Uh... <laughs> I think it's uh, purely like mathematical physicist uh, paranoia about not being able to prove something obvious. So I should actually mention on this. So, so obviously we know this separation of variable story is very closely related to this gelfand satan story. Uh, this makes things very nice because the beta roots for Gelf and Satan are Im immensely easy to count because they're all just in homogeneity plus some number. And what you can show is that all beta roots you start with from original XSX spin chain uh, get mapped to some very nice set of beta roots for Gelf and Satan when you take the corresponding limit. And there you can easily count. And then you can say that because you have completeness of beta equations in this limit, you have beta equations for generic cho choice of the twist as well. So. All of this technology allows you to prove completeness, for example, for SU2, two lines, um, which is also what they do, but in a more cumbersome way. So it really depends on your community, right? I kind of agree with Collier and that our community, this isn't really much of anything. Yeah, I know, but th there should be some, uh, how to see, uh, some, some agreement between the two communities, because otherwise there would be a, a kind of uh, uh, war and uh, well, yeah. the, how, how can we reach agreement? They just uh, say they don't believe, but at the same time, they don't. Then they should find a state which cannot be described by Bittanzas, right? That never happened so far. And uh, furthermore, there are proofs, right, at the moment. Uh, and I think D Dima, is he finishing the paper to prove it rigorously or what's going on? Uh, I mean, he's been, for the past like six months, he said it would take one more week every week. Um, so I'm not sure, I expect it to be out soon, but yes, they are able to prove completeness for SU n slash m and fundamental representation using completely rigorous arguments. 
But uh, yeah, the, the physical level of rigor, it, it's kind of obvious. You you take this limit when the bit uh, sides of the spin chain decouple, right? When like in yes, the it is already launched and, and then you can solve explicitly bit on that and match it one to one with beta states and then rely yes. on analytic continuation because number of states is an integer and it's also a continuous function. That's what these yes. people do normally, right? As an argument and it cannot change. Yeah, I know, but uh, of course there there uh, there should be some uh, mathematical proof of this uh, statement just to to. Uh, uh, just uh, very hard to know what would uh, actually account for them as a mathematical proof. Right? <laughs> like, I mean, if you get really picky, I would prefer to see some com computer uh, provable uh, proof of whatever they do, right? Um, with some uh, computer. Uh, you know this all these proofs uh, these computers you can they can uh, verify uh, like uh, number the uh, not number theory but also like uh, set theory right, right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's get it to this uh, level and uh, and see what happens yeah and s since we were discussing uh, this, uh, who, who was the first to write this expression in terms of q uh, of uh, Baxter uh, polynomials uh, for the separated uh, basis. What? In terms of Qs, for, for SUN, it was uh, us with Fyodor and Grisha. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Steinian also wrote for SU2, right? Sorry? The Steinian also wrote this expression in terms of Qs for SU2, I believe. Yeah, for yeah, SU2. No, but, but SU Let's say for SUN, for some. Uh, some yeah, for, for, for SN, definitely there was no, nothing like that in Scranian or before. This is the uh, first time. No, no, but uh, was it in Maya Nicoli or uh, in, in another group? So. No, the, their paper was a few years later, wasn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't so, think uh, they are saying they, they did it first, right? Maybe they did uh, it. First. So they well, are I, I think that, level, but. I, I, I think I think they are saying they did they did it first, but uh, well, this is a factually incorrect. You can just go on our hive and uh, check the years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's that's a complicated uh, uh, work to convince them that what's on archive is the reality. So. <laughs> well, I think in their last paper they kind of make an effort to actually uh, give the the credit to our work. Uh, if you see the citation of the last paper, it, at least uh, it, it doesn't look unfair to me immediately. Okay. Good, so I'm, I'm done with my, uh, my, my questions. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for the nice seminar. And uh, thank you, Kolya, for, for uh, making this possible. Yeah, thank you for coming. And maybe Andrea, Andrea, are you here? Maybe you can comment on the next big seminar unless there are more questions to Paul. Uh, yes, sure. So next week will be a seminar by Carlo Meneghelli. I don't know, maybe Carlo can say a few words about uh, uh, Yes, so I'm here. Um, I will talk about uh, some 1D conformal bootstrap-like problem which is related to the whistle line and equal force per mills and i will somehow recover few results hopefully many results or some results of uh Kolya last paper um, from the booster point of view we got something from using integrability and i will describe the booster approach to this 1d problem okay. i will send an abstract at some point i believe and then, uh, Andrea, we have uh, one more speaker for another week, is that correct? And then what happens next? So if there are some volunteers. Yeah, we have a few speakers lined up. Uh, I think the week after would be Nathan Levin about Sigma models. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, feel free to propose speakers. Yeah, but uh, yeah, should propose a, a subject for a talk please uh, write to Kolya or some of us and it would be great if anyone wants to volunteer to give a talk I think we have now filled for about three or four weeks more but then it's all free
All right. So thanks everyone for coming. Let's thank Paul again. Okay. See you next week. So uh, you can also advertise it a bit more broadly. We still have, uh, I don't know, 50 uh, slots until we saturate Zoom. Uh, so that will be probably the same link as today. Uh, so it's easy to join. Okay. Thank you. Bye.